Hey guys, welcome to my new cute room setup. I really love how sp- What the- Looks like a blind person arranged this. So I recently graduated college and moved into a room all by myself, like a big boy. And uh, this is basically my first time not having to share a room with someone. So it was really nice. Uh, you can see all my garbage on the floor right here. So here you can see my roommate doing his nighttime exercises. I'm kidding, that's a tweaker. And finally, when there were no more monsters nearby, I decided to meditate for calling my phone for a couple of hours, then face the sleep demons. When I woke up, I was met with a relief that they hadn't encountered me yet. But an even uneasier feeling overwhelmed me when I realized that the distances between the door, the closet, the bed, the desk were excruciatingly far and really suboptimal for someone short and lazy like me. After my legs started cramping, I realized that the room is like a fully connected graph where the door, bed, desk, and closet are like the nodes, and the paths between them are like the edges. Now, if only there was a really obedient slave that could try every room configuration and tell me the one with the least walking. A piece has four XY coordinates as its corners. Some of them are movable, like the desk and the bed. Some of them are not, like the closet and the door, and you can rotate it. The center is just the average of the four corners, and we rotate the corners relative to the center. A room also has four corners containing a list of pieces and a path width depending on how fat you are. The total walking distance is the sum over all possible pairwise Euclidean distances taking each piece's center, aka summing up edge lengths. In addition to minimizing the total distance, we need to also make sure that a room configuration is valid. We'll want to penalize pieces based on how far they are outside of the room walls how much any two pieces are intersecting each other, and penalize how much any piece is intersecting any path that doesn't start or end at itself. The first two parts should be obvious because you can't have any objects outside of your room or two objects intersecting each other. But the rationale behind the third part is that, in my opinion, a good room setup would allow me to walk between any two destinations unobstructed. This will make a lot more sense later, but you can begin to see how this is starting to look like an optimization problem, in the sense that the total distance is the function that we're trying to minimize, and the validity penalty represents the constraints that we have to work between. But how do we detect intersection between a piece and a piece, or a piece and a path? We can just check if any of their edges taken as line segments intersect each other. In a stroke of pure genius, I found this on Wikipedia. We know that each line segment has a corresponding infinite line, and unless the infinite lines are parallel, T and U tell us where along those two lines they intersect. So T and U both have to be between 0 and 1 for this finite line segments to intersect. Finally, to help with optimization, we're going to use this piece of jello to make the penalty continuous instead of a binary yes or no intersection. Now at this point, you're probably sick of looking at the code and hearing me explain it. So here's some more code. So we've gone over how to tell if the edges of a path are being intersected by a piece, but we haven't actually gone over how to get those four corners of the path that define the edges. First, we can calculate the slope of the original path line, then find the equations for the lines on the short sides of the paths by getting the perpendicular slope and plugging in the endpoints to find the y-intercept. Now to get those two red corners of the path that lie on the yellow line, we use the fact that they're both a half width away from the center point. This is the equation of a circle, and once you combine that with the yellow line and you plug it in and simplify it, it yields a quadratic equation. Using the quadratic formula, this yields two solutions, which are the two corners of the short side since they're the intersection of the circle and the line. Now do this for the other side too, and you have the four corners of the path. If you can't tell what I'm doing, I'm keeping my math skills sharp so I can continue to lecture you for the rest of this video.
This went under my roommate's bed. I threw it in the trash. After getting the dimensions of my desk, door, bed, closet, and the room itself with my two measuring devices, I was finally able to use them to create the room and piece objects in code and visualize it as you see here. The white objects are the immovable pieces, which are the door and the closet. The gray pieces are the movable desk and bed, and the red lines represent the path. Here you can see why my room setup is so problematic. It's almost 4600 pixels of total distance, which is equivalent to 73 and a half steps. Not to mention it's not even fully valid since the bed clips the path from the desk to the door. If you're wondering what these disgusting bugs are, it's particle swarm optimization. Like the name implies, you initialize a swarm of particles which each represent a candidate solution to the problem. In our case, one particle has six dimensions, an x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and rotation of the bed and the desk. We define a penalty function to evaluate how poor of a score a given particle has. Every iteration, each particle's velocity and position gets updated according to this algorithm. First, choose as hyperparameters the inertia, w, cognitive parameter, c1, and social parameter, c2. First, take the inertia times the previous velocity, plus the cognitive parameter times a random vector, r1, times the vector towards the particle's personal best position, plus the social parameter times a random vector, r2, times the vector towards the entire swarm's best position. The parameter names make sense because inertia controls how much particles keep moving, how they were previously, cognitive controls how much particles exploit their own knowledge, and social controls how much particles exploit other particles' collective knowledge. By repeating this many iterations for every particle, we semi-randomly explore a large state space as a group and hopefully converge towards a solution that is very close to the minimum. Particle swarm optimization is not gradient based, so it doesn't make any guarantees that we'll find a global or even local minimum. But I decided to use it since it seemed to me that the scoring function with all the graph distances and validity penalties wouldn't be easily differentiable. As you'd see if you were paying attention, we'd score a single particle by moving the bed and the desk where it says to, and taking the total graph distance of the room plus the validity penalty both values that we want to minimize. After testing many hyperparameters, I ended up using an inertia of 0.6, cognitive of 0.8, social of 0.5. The final swarm was 100 ants big, and we're scared into running around for a thousand iterations. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, optimization. If you're asleep by this point in the video, this is when you may want to wake up again. Or you can go back to sleep, that's fine too. Pathetic, right? I don't, in fact, own two different rooms to optimize. After yelling at the ants many times to try harder, I noticed that all of the best and valid runs roughly resulted in either the picture on the left or the picture on the right. You can see that the left one has a slightly lower total distance, but I still ended up choosing the right one so that the desk would be by the door. This way, sunlight would stop shining on my monitor and more importantly I wouldn't be rolling down my 5 degree angled excuse of a floor. Now, watch me transform the most boring room you've ever seen into the most autistic one. Here's my new room. So far, it's been a month of subjecting myself to this, and I can honestly say I don't regret my decision. I thought it would feel extremely weird, but the fact that I can now spend most of my time in the center of the room, rather than facing a wall, makes the room feel, rather than just look more spacious. Here's a before and after bird's eye view of my room along with me walking around how I normally do in each. 
The old room had a total graph distance of 74 of my door feet, while the new one is only 59. You can see how efficiently I can go from being productive at my desk to watching YouTube in my bed. This new layout has had a ton of benefits, but just to list a few. I'm not as tired from walking, it feels more open being in the center, my chair doesn't roll, the sun is not in my eyes, my testosterone levels are higher, I'm having sex more often, I no longer have flat feet, I grew 4 inches.